Good afternoon. I'm here to talk to you about C.S. Lewis for 10 minutes. I kind of like this format. It's, like a, it's kind of a hit and run kind of thing. So I can throw it at you, and then I can do the mad dash, and then somebody else can hit you before you realize what happened. The lie of realism is what I'm talking about. Now, this is, this is a topic that's, that's near and dear to my heart because I write fantasy novels. So I write fantasy novels. I live in the same ghetto, the, the literary ghetto where Lewis does. And Lewis was always criticized for not doing serious things. He has one great big serious book, English literature in the 16th century excluding drama. Big, big fat one. And he finally did that just to get people to shut up, that he could do serious academic things if he really wanted to. So fine, there you go, take it. But Lewis wrote fantasy stories not because he was immature, not because he was childish, although he was in the best possible way. He wrote fantasy stories because he thought correctly that that's what the world was actually like. The lie of realism is that somehow we've let people name important fiction in which there is no soul, no spirit, no supernatural, realistic. So realistic fiction, realism, there can be no magic, but more importantly, there can be no supernatural, there can be no God in realism, there can be no even soul to the character. The character cannot have a spirit, cannot have a soul, and nor can anything else. But when you look at the stories that God wrote, not just the stories he told in na the natural world, which are rich with crazy, but the story, the book, the actual book. What do you have in the book? The book of Judges is where superhero stories were invented. Like, here's a guy with crazy long hair, an unfortunate weakness for women, and a jawbone. Okay. There's a little throwaway about Shamgar, another guy apparently like that who kills a thousand people with an ox goad. David, and who, how's David become famous? He's a giant killer. Okay, here we go, more realism. The giant comes out with six fingers, huge. Okay, great. Look at the stories that are actually told by God, and then look at what we call realism. Oh boy, I wish, I wish Lewis had written some realistic fiction. Well, he thinks he did. That's why he wrote it that way. He wrote Narnia the way he wrote it. He wrote the Space Trilogy the way he wrote it, not because he thinks, oh, this world is so boring, I, I'm gonna make something up that's more amusing to me. He wrote it as a tribute to this reality, as an imitation of the same kind of reality that God created, and he was, he was paying tribute. He was trying to get people to look, to open their eyes, to see the amazingness of the world that they're in. I tell school kids, when I talk to school children, I say, okay, A, are dwarves sucked up a bunch of black goop from inside this planet? Oh yeah, planet. We're on a rock, mostly molten lava, flying through outer space at about Mach 86 right now. Just humming really fast. And also we're doing this like a yo-yo being swung around a ball of fire in the sky. That's our setting. Like, okay, so go with me now. We're on a ball of rock flying at Mach 86 through outer space around a ball of fire in the sky. What kind of story are we telling? Like, we're immediately in sci-fi fantasy section of the bookstore, embarrassed, hoping none of our real academic friends will see us. That's this world. Inchworms wriggle around, little corpulent, you know, pills, eat your apples, and then turn into liquid. They liquefy and become moths. How does that happen? I, I tell people all the time, we don't just lie to children. Caterpillars really turn into butterflies. They actually do. You know, they, they you know, you're around eating everything like a little kid's book. And then for my next trick, I will turn into a soup. Liquid, full on liquid. And I will now reconstitute myself as a gentle flying object. Like this is this world. This is a fantasy world. It's a crazy fantasy world. And this is why Lewis wrote what he wrote. I can't tell you how many Christians I've talked to who say, well, I love his nonfiction, but fantasy, you know, I just don't, I wish he wrote some serious stuff. It's like, well, say the same thing to God. 
wish you'd do some serious stuff because I'm seeing a lot of beetles. There's ants everywhere. What are you doing? Can we do something serious? We need more college professors. No. Like very, very quickly you realize we don't need that at all. Lewis looked at the world. He was amazed by the world. He loved the artisanship. He loved the personality that was in every corner of this world, and so he imitated it. Where is the first wizard battle in all of literature? Wizard duel, like okay, Harry Potter versus Voldemort is in a grand and very lengthy tradition, and it all goes back to when an old dude walked into the court of an emperor in Egypt a long time ago, leaning on a stick. Oh my goodness, a magic stick. That's the first one. And then even more beautifully, on, contrary to what modern people who really wanted to be realistic would say, they would say, well, the, magi the magicians of Pharaoh, they kind of, well, they cheated. It was a sleight of hand. It was like a card trick, really. What does the Bible say? The Bible said that those guys could turn sticks into snakes. They actually could do it. They could actually turn water into blood. That's as freaky as it gets. Stick, I'm gonna turn this into a living, slithering serpent. And Moses says, okay, mine's gonna eat yours. <laughs> That's the world in which we live. Moses turns a river into blood. Moses calls down an angel of death. And then this is when he starts playing for real. An angel of death. And he gives the people of God a talisman to defend themselves, to be passed over. Hello, fantasy novel. You submit this to an editor, and he'll say, well, this isn't realism. So, I mean, maybe you could send it over to the people who stick their books in the grocery stores. Go over there. And Lewis and Tolkien understood that the world really is this way. This is how God told it, and they imitated it. This is a world in which a man walked on water, in which bread came from heaven, in which bread always comes from heaven. Always. In which we're still held by God, rocketing around a ball of fire in the sky. This is our world. And it's not, unfortunately or fortunately, realistic. Our world is not realistic at all. Check out a frog sometime. It's just not realistic. I don't know why God expects me to believe that at all. A dragonfly, really? Mm hmm. An insect that's jet propelled when a baby underwater, gulping water, spraying it out of its hindquarters. It's a little jet engine. That's how it swims really fast, eating juvenile mosquitoes. And then it does what? Climbs up a piece of grass, splits open its back. <sighs> and has a completely different creature crawl out? Really? And this one is built entirely differently, the only winged insect with piston engines? Like four wings, individually piston fired, 360 degree vision? What? What is this? How did this happen? By accident, no. But really, realism is a lie, it's a profound lie, and Lewis isn't our little vice as Christians. Lewis isn't like, well, we like him because he said good things in nonfiction, and these are good for children. These are good for us because the world is wonderful. It is fantasy. It's not realism as we would call it. And we need to get our eyes open and be more childlike the way Lewis was and the way all the saints previous, all the saints in heaven are at least now. And I'll leave you with one last thought. If the, if the gates are made of pearls in heaven, do you know what pearls are made of? Right, envision those oysters. Thank you.